morning, everyone. <coughs> Welcome for joining me. Uh, it's a much denser crowd than I expected. Machine, most sexy item in the factory automation. But uh, thank you. Uh, also, uh, my thanks to the people from Incube for organizing this event and uh, having given me the opportunity to uh, to talk to you for uh, half an hour. Um, Talking about machine vision uh, and what can you do now, what can you do for your customers and in the future. So no big hypothetic uh, uh, theories here, uh, real life examples of uh, real life products that, uh, that are available today. So a little bit about Omron Microscan. Um, we, uh, we have been in the uh, cradle of barcode reading since 1982. Yeah. That uh, we are one of the companies that claim that have invented the laser barcode reading. And uh, there's a few more. And um, we have been, really Microscan has been in barcode reading since then. Uh, in um, 2005, Microscan bought, or in 2008, sorry, Microscan bought the machine vision business from Siemens who just three years before had acquired the company Acuity. And Acuity is basically the cradle of machine vision. Yeah. They were the inventors of the original uh, data matrix code in 1991. And um, they also had a company, Nearlight, that is still in our portfolio and has very advanced lighting, which in many uh, factory environments is, uh, is very important. So more than 30 years of innovation in auto ID. This is one of the first laser scanner products. And uh, we have uh, a very strong leadership in a, in a niche market, which is the clinical diagnostics, where the uh, ac accuracy of barcode reading is very important because you don't want to mix up blood and urine tests. Yeah, it's very important. And, uh, and there we have a very strong uh, market share. Pioneers in the machine vision, I said, uh, this thing that looks like a fridge is uh, the first ever PC-based uh, machine vision, uh, which was uh, presented in uh, the uh, late 90s. I don't have a clicker, so I have to come back to, the to my PC anymore. Uh, currently, um, Microscan is offering a, uh, a very broad platform of both barcode scanners and machine vision cameras. They are extremely small. Yeah, I have one with me. This is uh, the ID30, which is the middle one. We have one uh, that is a bit bigger and has uh, IP65 ratings, but with integrated lighting, uh, fixed focus, but also uh, adaptive focus with a liquid lens. And basically, it's the same product. It's the same platform which is built into three different packages. One plastic, very small, no lighting for the clinical market. And then four, industrial barcode reading uh, with a more rugged uh, package. The thing is, every product you buy is either an ID reader or a machine vision camera. It's just a bootstrap that you, or a license you acquire to upgrade the basic 2D barcode reader into a machine vision product. And you can see they're very small, so they'll fit anywhere. <coughs> last, October, uh, last October, it was announced that uh, Microscan was, acquired, was being acquired by Omron. And Omron has a very broad range of products in, uh, with uh, autonomous intralogistics robots very fancy things that follow you around or stop when somebody is walking in their path and give a warning like, yeah, please remove yourself from my path or I will crush you. Um, very advanced uh, quality inspection uh, in, in uh, wafer manufacturing, in soldering. They have very advanced x-ray machines to see if the soldering goes all through in, in the uh, digital uh, manufacturing. Robots, uh, we acquired, or Omron has acquired a company called Adept, 
and has very advanced robots. Uh, and uh, the traditional uh, pick and place uh, thing, but also Omron has a, a certain uh, vision that whatever they do should be, the purpose should be to help humanity further. Yeah. So they used all the technology to make a ping pong playing robot. So basically it's a, it's a robot that can uh, adapt to the player and it really plays ping pong. If you ever, uh, ever get the chance, Google it and, and uh, you will see it's, uh, it's a, a really amazing uh, machine. But it combines all the technology, yeah? artificial intelligence, vision, not only vision with one camera, but multiple cameras, and of course the flexibility and the dynamics of, uh, of uh, robotics. Machine uh, safeguarding, which is security, and then a very, very broad range of uh, sensors in all sizes and forms, ranging from the smallest to uh, the most advanced, and uh, very advanced uh, machine control systems. This is a video of uh, the vision offer of uh, Omron. I'll put on a bit of sound. So this is a PC-based system. Uh, so you can do very advanced uh, machine applications. It has a dedicated controller with uh, four uh, cores. And you can integrate up to four cameras. And they work in parallel, yeah? not in, not in uh, sequence, but you can really do very advanced technique. And when we talk about the future, what it will bring us, it's, it's going to be clear that all the elements that bring today this kind of applications and this kind of solution are going to be influenced by what is in there already. It's only going to get faster, yeah? higher speeds, etc., etc. So this goes very much beyond what, what used to be in the early days. Uh, is it there, is it not there kind of uh, application. Also very uh, intuitive software. I think that's also something that has changed over the years. The software used to, you had to really know the software to be able to uh, write an application for your machine vision. Now it's open standards, it's all forms of connection, all forms of uh, protocols are, are everywhere and you can just drag and drop a task to do whatever function and we'll go over the, the possible functions in general that are now available in, uh, in, in machine vision application. A very broad range of cameras uh, fits on, on this and uh, so. <coughs> Next is a, a microscan video, which is much lower level, but nonetheless very interesting. Um, when we say machine vision helps the manufacturers to reduce cost and improve quality, that's really uh, the, the core application of machine vision. Um, error proofing is everything on my production line. Is it exactly what it should be? Um, is it put together and we'll see there are some basic functions that will help you to see if uh, a digital plate is filled with the right uh, components or if a fuse box from uh, uh, car manufacturers is with the right color of fuses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, quality inspection, of course, product identification, part traceability, and robot guidance. Uh, they also need cameras, they are very fancy, but I... So this is an example of uh, a compliance issue. So uh, in some countries they make vodka, and uh, they, as, as usual, the government wants to collect their share of uh, the, the taxes, and uh, so they issue special labels which the manufacturer has to put on the bottles, and they need to be checked for the moment 16 times during the production. Now, the government is very poor apparently because the quality of their printer is very poor and the, the labels they are delivering are horrifying. So the, the vodka manufacturer has uh, 
search for uh, a brand that, that is able to uh, scan all the codes up to 99.7%. And that's why they have chosen Microscan to go in this project. Uh, quickly look at a few uh, success stories. And from its past, Microscan has been focusing on packaging, uh, electronics, digital manufacturing. Uh, smartphones have been a huge success for us. Uh, life science, like I said, the clinical uh, diagnostic products, and then consumer goods and automotives, but mainly the, uh, uh, the electronics part of automotives. So this is an example of a screen where you build your own machine vision task. Yeah? You have a number of uh, tasks in the bottom. You can see, you can do OCR, you can do uh, blob count, you can do measurements, you can do OCV, uh, and you just click on the part of the screen what the camera is seeing, and you tell him that's, that's the code I want to read, yeah? or that's the date I want to verify, or that's the lot number I want to make sure is within a certain range. Yeah? So there's a lot of, uh, of things. <coughs> Advantage of a camera is you can do it all at once. Previously it was possible, but you had to have uh, several uh, laser scanners to, uh, to read uh, different codes on, on, on one label. So what are these tools quickly? Uh, we can read codes. We have an algorithm, and I hear it that from Onrom that was the main reason why they acquired uh, Microscan, because we have a very advanced uh, algorithm, the detection algorithm that uh, not only reads codes on paper, but also on uh, direct part marking, so laser or etching or something like that uh, is very, very advanced. We can read text, uh, we can uh, verify text, we can verify code, and I'll have a quick topic on that in the end. We can look if something is there, presence, absence, we can count the number of things we can see, we can measure, we can locate things, we can detect colors, so in pharmaceutical manufacturing, for example, you're have a machine where you're expecting red pills in the blisters. When there's a blue pill in one of them, yeah, that, you don't want to have that. <laughs> yeah. and to be sure that there's zero blue pills in the red pill blister, and that's the only way you can do it. And at the speeds, and I'll talk quickly about the speeds later, that's very important to have a high reliable uh, solution. Some examples of new technologies uh, and new barcodes. So uh, the dot matrix uh, and the data matrix, which is both on the Intel processor and on the base maker. Uh, there you can see a combination of uh, OCR and uh, data matrix reading. Very small codes, as you can see in the back. This is a, a new one. This is dot code, which is used for uh, in the uh, cigarette manufacturing. Uh, because of compliance, again, all the cigarette manufacturers have to prepay the tax at the moment of manufacturing of a pack of cigarettes. So uh, Philip Oryx, for example, they have to prepay if they manufacture a pack of cigarettes for the UK. And there needs to be a continuous loop and data loop. The government of the UK can look into the manufacturing data of PMI to, uh, to see what is happening and where things are going going to become uh, fairly, fairly impossible to, uh, to play this system. Like I said quickly about uh, fast-moving uh, applications, um, up to 1,000 parts per minute, uh, we can use the, the microhawk. So for cosmetic package inspection, we have a customer who is checking uh, in his final filling and packaging line if the uh, color of I think it's called foundation, which uh, something, uh, yeah, foundation. They have like a thousand different colors yeah, uh, with uh, very exotic names in very exotic packages from very different brands, and they all come out of the same factory. <laughs> yeah. So that's matching the label with the label of the bottle, checking if the right color is inside, and then uh, completing the package, and then for tracking and tracing, storing 
all the data which is in the box, like lot number, production date, uh, barcode, etc. Uh, is a complex uh, process, doesn't go that fast, so that's up to 180. Uh, pharma packaging is also not extremely fast because of the fact that some quality uh, guidebooks still involve uh, human uh, verification. Yeah. Some Japanese quality manuals say that on a production line you still need three points of human in space. Much better, but still have them. But that reduces the speed of manufacturing. Uh, cigarette pack reading, so just a one pack, the barcode reading and the dot code. Um, that is, that is uh, uh, still a low capacity, but then once you go up, we have a partner in Denmark who has uh, a solution. And it's not just about the, the code reading, of course, yeah. but it's at uh, 20,000 uh, products per minute. It's, you just cannot follow one package in the, in, in the production. The rise are too slow. Okay. But uh, our, our MV4000, which is a, uh, a very performant uh, camera, can still uh, follow that. And you can see that according to the different uh, applications, you have different uh, speed requests. Um, an example of optical character verification, I think this is not uncommon for, for these days, PCs and scanners do it, but this is in very bad conditions with uh, very inaccurate technology. Yeah. Laser marking, uh, continuous inject printing, or uh, these things, they tend, to, uh, they tend to degrade over time. Yeah. And, and uh, you need a reliable system that can, I'm not gonna say, uh, it's artificial intelligence, but you need a reliable system that up to a certain level is confident that that is the right character, number, or symbol that you were looking for. Presence, absence, uh, a number of uh, uh, applications, uh, count pixels, yeah. And uh, what is important is when you see the image, you can ask the system to give back or the number of pixels that they found within what you were looking for, or just a basic pass and fail. Ah, this is good, this is not good, and then it relays the information to yeah, a relay that pushes out a product or to a PLC. Mentioned that before, presence, absence, using color. Uh, you see the fuse box, yeah, you just program the system where you expect a yellow one, a green one, and a red one and uh, it gives you a pass and fill for the whole box or for the individual. Uh, very important, uh, there was a, a big scandal uh, in Campbell soup some time ago where they mixed up the labels between the mushroom soup and the tomato soup. So people were buying on the label tomato soup, they opened their can and they had mushroom soup, right? Uh, and that's uh, one of the things when Kraft Foods and all these people have realized, like, yeah, we need something that can match this, that this doesn't happen anymore. Um, <clears throat> another thing is, if they uh, collect the lot number, the recall, which is very expensive for a manufacturer, the recall quantity gets smaller. So they can better localize due to the tracking and tracing. They only have to, before they had to call back, I don't know, 10,000 cans. Today, in some applications at uh, Heinz, the tomato ketchup company, they can locate a unit in 150 bottles, which is uh, the quantity of bottles they make a real achievement. <coughs> yeah, feature counting, is there something, isn't there something, and, and then uh, you Again, give the locations where there is something for a robot to pick up this little element or not. Uh, measurement is quite obvious. Yeah. Assembly, uh, in the assembly line, like I mentioned, we were very successful and still are with the mobile, uh, the mobile phone market. Uh, just check, uh, you can train the, the camera just to check, is there a screw, is there a component, uh, is it filled, is it not filled? 
Where is it exactly located? Is it within tolerance that it will not inflict with another element or a cover coming up and stuff like that? This is a this is a tough one, yeah. Uh, and I've seen demos from uh, from Omron. They are very advanced with this. This is uh, uh, an application that is very high in demand by all the smartphone manufacturers and. Uh, Apple did a study that about 17% of their returns is due to this. Because there's a scratch on the back or on the front of the device that people pay more than $1,000 for. Yeah. And you don't want to, yeah, if you, if you throw $1,000 on the table, you don't want something with a scratch. And the scratch can only be seen in a certain angle with a certain light. And some, but the software that I've seen from uh, from Omron can detect scratches that are not visible to the human eye. Yeah, and they use a, a wide range of newly developed artificial intelligence tools for it, and the results are, are getting really, really much better. So this is a, a, a very easy return on investment because you need to play with the angle, you need to play with the, the, the light, the intensity of the light and the, the angles of the light, and, and so on. Another application, I know some people are here from uh, the dairy uh, business. This is a, a well-known uh, application at the, the manufacture of uh, Actimel. Uh, I don't know who owns Actimel these days, but, ah, okay. <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, so we check for every little Actimel bottle that is produced, we check if the, the ceiling of the uh, a cap is, is, uh, is as it should be. Because if the cap is not on, yeah. your product is lost, but you should get more. Um, another, so as you know, might imagine uh, OCR requires a lot of processing. And as this is on here, the processing happens in the camera. What comes out the other end yeah, is pass fail, or is 75 pixels, or is whatever you configure it to be. But the processing of the images at those speeds happens in this little box. Yeah. So OCR is very, very demanding. Yeah. Now OCV is uh, verification of characters. Yeah. If you have a date, for example, <coughs> Everybody knows that there's maximum 31 days in a month. So if you, at first sight, see that there's the, it's the 42nd of the month, it yeah, doesn't fly. You don't have to know that it is 42. But you expect on the first digit a 0, 1, a 2, or a 3, and not anything else. So the effort that this little thing has to do can be limited by the results as they go along. Yeah. Sounds a bit freaky, but uh, that's how it works. Uh, you can check, uh, you can check the, uh, the range of the serial number. You just say, OK, I make something from this number to this number. And, and uh, if it uh, matches, then it goes on. If it doesn't, <coughs> quick topic on uh, verification. Yeah? Verification is. And I spoke to some people that in the previous days, verification is, is, is the application for machine vision. All the other stuff I told is very nice. You can add value. But verification of a code is something that is going to become more and more important. Yeah? Last, uh, no, not in 2016, the FDA in America issued a, a ruling, the UDI, which is Unique Device Identification, which means that every medical device class one, so stuff that remains in the body, yeah? hip replacements, uh, whatever. Yeah. I'm not going to go into details. I'm not a doctor. But they ne each need, need a, a unique code, which is stored centrally in a database in the FDA in the US. And if you do not have your product registered there, you don't come into the US anymore. This is going to happen in Europe in 2019. And I believe also in Saudi Arabia, it's going to be uh, in 2019 or 2020. With these compliance dates, they 
shuffle around a bit, but I'll make sure that I provide Incube with our view on the compliance dates for these markets. Now, medical devices class one is the, is the highest, okay? And, and gradually they are coming down. Yeah, you can imagine that. The idea ha of having a central database globally of all the medical devices is a very good idea because there have been some issues uh, in the past that uh, people were getting sick because the hip replacement contained in certain batches too much titanium, which was fixing or, or messing up the blood uh, balance. And people got sick, and after three years, they figured out, yes, it's the hip replacement. But then they didn't know who had that type of hip replacement with that too high content of titanium. And that's how they come. Now, the, the concept is, is really great. The application and the implication is a bit more difficult than that. So all these things get a bit extended in time, and people are giving a bit more leadway to, uh, to use that. But the fact that this unique number is on the package of this hip replacement means that there needs to be a certainty that any scanner anywhere in the world that complies with the GS1 rules is able to read this code. So if it ends up in an in a, in a operating theater and you're not being, you can't scan the component, the component is or useless. Throw it away. But then the vendor of that component, that hip replacement, has to prove that the barcode that was on that bag was GS1 compliant. And that's where verification comes in. So since 2016 in the US, every barcode that is on a medical device class one has a verification report which is then generated by uh, a GS1 compliant. Uh, so why do codes go bad? Well, every marking system degrades over time. Your printer, yeah, the, 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 the ribbon is getting yeah, maybe not so good. The print head is too high and creates smudging. Um, the, the ribbons, uh, not the ribbons, the, the rollers, sorry. They, yeah, they, the paper rollers, they wear out and, and they cause a slight <laughs> Just a little shift, uh, uh, boogie, and, and it results in a bad code. That's also true. Barcodes never get better after leaving your marking system. So we have systems with Domino and with VideoJet that verify the code right after marking. We get grade A, 100% yeah? quality. And if we trace that code until it gets out of the factory, not getting better. Yeah? Machines are touching the code, people are touching the code, there's wrappers over the code, there's blisters, <coughs> there's plastic molded on the product, which all causes problems. And also human error, of course, can cause, cause bad codes. Quickly, a few examples. Uh, improper of inconsistent marking, uh, very often happen with uh, dot pin. So it's like little nails hammering in, in uh, the, the material, uh, improper or inconsistent mark or cell location. Yeah, it's, it, it's a very technical uh, explanation, but every code has its uh, uh, driving rules, like on the road. Yeah? If you drive out of your lane, well, you're heading for trouble. Same with the code. Uh, the geometry of the code might be f uh, wrong. Like I said, if the roller is not set correctly or is not where not, you get during the printing, you get a little notch, and uh, it's uh, <coughs> surface damage, obviously, and then contrast, low or inconsistent throughout the code. Now, what's the difference between reading and verification? You can produce a code, read it with a scanner, and then it works. And that's good for you. You can feel happy. But that's just checking. Yeah? That's just reading the code. You're just, I mean, it's critical, but you're just proving that the code you produced, you're able to read with your scanner in your lighting environment, and that's it. 
So out of the zillion possibilities, you can check one. Yeah? And you can do it in the morning, in the evening, but anyway. The idea of verification is that you do in a controlled lighting environment with a controlled and calibrated device under controlled circumstances and according to standards that it's read. That gives you the uh, security that the product you're delivering to the market is okay. Impact in medical devices is very strong. There's a lot of control. But we're seeing also applications in retail yeah. where, uh, and car manufacturers who are imposing this kind of verification to their uh, suppliers because, I mean, if it cannot be read in their tracking and tracing in their system, then it's, uh, then it's worthless, useless. So they impose fines to their third party manufacturers if the code is not read. Retailers, same story. They want to be sure that everything that goes through their checkout is scanned in the proper way. Yeah? That it doesn't give a false positive, for example. Because that's a big uh, loss for them. So what is important? You want to catch the problem before it hurts you. Yeah? If, you if you find a no read after some time, and then do the necessary work to correct, then there's already a whole bunch of products, if you put your level, your quality level on level C, a whole bunch of products that are in the market, and whatever they are, the products, yeah, it can be boxes of spaghetti up to ba blood, blood bags or anything like that, that are in an uncontrolled way and could bite you in the back, basically. I'm doing in terms of time. Sorry, I'm almost done. No, I'll speed up a little bit. So what's machine vision? Like I said, yeah. Uh, sorry, what's uh, verification? It's according to a set of standards, and there's a, a number of groups of standards. So GS1 is is a global standard. But you have AIM as a global standard. You have uh, ISO, and uh, you basically rate every barcode and you generate a report which you can pull out later in case you need it. Uh, DPM is very special. Uh, like I said, the code is in the substrate. It's in the metal, plastic, aluminum, whatever. It's very challenging to read. Uh, before I joined Microscan, I was asking myself, why do people put codes on, on, uh, on, on metal and on products that nobody is able to read? But you need a certain technical environment uh, in terms of low angle lighting that allows you to uh, alternate the different sources of light that you can read in the code. Because if you look at it with natural light and with the human eye, the chance that uh, a scanner will able to, a normal scanner will never be able to read. But a DPM scanner is able to read that. Uh, the challenging part here is that it's relatively new, it's relatively uh, wild, wild west, uh, and uh, the codes and the, uh, the standards for these codes are becoming uh, slowly available. There are some codes that still don't have a standards that we cannot verify. I mentioned on the cigarette pack the dot code. There is no standard yet for dot code verification. And not verify it, but still everybody requires it because it's a, a very important part. Some challenging codes in uh, in Seattle, we have uh, a collection of bad codes. We call them the horrible 100. And if we develop new products or new algorithms, or that they all get tested, and they have to pass all, or the product doesn't get out. And you see some very, uh, the, the, the new things these days are the very small codes in uh, digital manufacturing. They are really practically, uh, for the human eye, you can barely see them. Yeah? Uh, just a dot. I think I mentioned all of this. This is an example of a uh, report according to ISO 15415. 
And then uh, I have two more slides in five minutes <laughs> uh, about the future. When I started uh, my, my uh, pitch this morning, I mentioned that in the video you saw from the Omron FH uh, machine vision series, uh, there were a number of technical elements, CPU, uh, connections, protocols, uh, uh, connectivity, etc. cetera. Uh, and it's obvious that these in the future will evolve towards a higher speed, higher quality, higher throughput, everything higher, sharper, more accurate, etc. Um, the controllers will become at a higher speed. Uh, this will allow higher speed image transfer and image merging technology. So you will be able to stitch several images into one image, which then can be read or interpreted by the, uh, by the software. Yeah? And you can go much deeper into, uh, you can do uh, all kinds of photographic techniques that people are using now in photography. You will be able to do at those speeds with that type of camera. Uh, don't compare the digital camera that is in that uh, handler there uh, with, with uh, an industrial grade camera. Uh, extended camera range, what we'll see in the future is that for PC-based systems, the range of cameras, uh, due to the specificities of the application, will become more extended. So that means that now we are in some way or form limited to the distance, to the angle of view, the depth of view, and uh, the quality and the volume of the demand in applications for machine cause the fact that those things will become uh, more widely available. Improved user interface. I showed you the user interface of, of AutoVision. That is further going to be uh, more interactive, faster, because you can manipulate whatever element you want on your AutoVision or on your machine vision application towards the speed and the quality of the images that are coming. And then, yes, the, the, the size of the cameras, although I think it's difficult to to make it much smaller than this because the lens and, and the, uh, the, the element, the, the, the sensor, of course, needs a certain place and you need, you need light. light. Yeah, it's difficult to read in the dark. I hear Canadians are afraid from the dark. <coughs> Those are the obvious ones. Yeah, I'm not looking in a crystal ball. I'm just extending what I can see in terms of things we have today. What is more important and what is more promising for the future, I think, is uh, the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, that is really something that, in my opinion, will, will create a, a real step forward in the way we are uh, interpreting and decoding those images. The speed will be a big factor and also the things we can come up with. I, you saw in the video the, the little gray cross they were detecting on a pane uh, the scratches, which uh, uh, will be, because it's a, an application that is very much in demand, of course, the, the speed of evolution goes faster in that application. Yeah. Um, 3D, yeah. 3D will be a bigger step than going from 1D to 2D. Uh, there are some cameras, and I believe one of our competitors bought a small company that was in 2 3D vision, but uh, it's early days. Yeah? It's really early days. It will add a lot of uh, applications in terms of sizing. Uh, the guys from uh, the DHLs, the FedEx, and stuff like that, they are uh, already for 10 or 15 years asking for 3D cameras because when they have a box flying by, yeah, they can they can see the box, measure the box completely in three dimensions and know how to fit it in the plane, and then how to fit it in the small truck, and then how to fit it in the car, and stuff like that. So that's a lot of information. You add weighting and stuff like that. That opens up a whole new uh, things of uh, applications if you, if you move into the 3D. Uh, another big thing in the future, in my opinion, is gonna be real time. Yeah. Very often, uh, machine vision applications are limited due to the speeds 
of transfer, the speed of uh, processing and stuff like that, and you build up a backlog as you go. Yeah. Build time meaning that the guy from Nestle is gonna be able to look on his network in all his factories to see if there's a camera that is failing or getting too much. I mean, we're going a bit in the direction of the, of the Omnitrux guys that, that they'll be able in combination with all the data that those cameras are generating that they'll be able to see fluctuations in, in tendencies. Yeah? That's, uh, that's the maybe a bigger uh, future concept. Another application in terms of uh, uh, future is, is robot guidance. <coughs> we have demos today of uh, robots that are uh, verifying or a final step verifying of lawn mowers. Lawn mower is manufactured yeah, to cut the grass. In, in uh, all parts of the world where there's a lot of rain and a lot of grass, people have the tendency, tendency to spend a weekend, a weekend mowing the grass. But anyway, those things get produced. Yeah. And uh, there's a, a robot with, uh, uh, I don't know how many degrees of flexibility, who's checking every different part of the lawnmower. If the oil cap is on, if uh, there's a fuse, if uh, the cable is, uh, put on the, the machine is, is at the right tension, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So those kind of things, uh, active line of sight and path planning. Uh, I mentioned the, uh, the <coughs> logistics robots from Onron that follow you around or, uh, I mean, in factories you won't see people carrying boxes and, and stuff anymore because even in car manufacturing, they are putting their trays and whatever work in progress they have, they put it on one of these robots and they follow them around or they tell them where to go and they go. So the camera, the, 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 the robot needs cameras to see what's around him and to make the right uh, decision. So those are a few of what I expect. Uh, one, one very nice thing is in, in precision manufacturing is the integration of the CAD drawing with the actual real-time position verification of something in the production line. So in an assembly environment, your, your parts all come in a different uh, setting and you need the next part to fit in a certain way. Well, they will be able to use the CAD drawing of both things that need to put together to uh, exactly pinpoint in what location those elements are. But you can imagine that requires processing speed, uh, higher definition cameras, etc. I'm around for the rest of the day, so is my colleague Wild. He's uh, in charge of uh, the Middle East uh, region and is, uh, has, is setting up an office in Dubai. Uh, please ask us any question you might have, and I thank you very much for your attention this morning. Thank you.